the Paul Leslie interviews. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest Lee Rittenauer is a guitarist, a recording artist. It's a great pleasure to have you here. All right, Paul. Glad to be talking to you. You've said before that your fans can't seem to peg you down because of just how many different types of styles you approach. You know, you could be somebody playing an electric, you could be somebody playing acoustic. If you had to define yourself, how would you define yourself? Well, I think my basis has always been firmly planted. Uh, I mean, I'm totally associated with the guitar since I was eight years old, and, and I got a lot of years on me now. I've been playing the guitar forever. So, and, you know, primarily most of my records, I mean, I have over 40 albums out by now, most of the albums are instrumentally based and mostly, you know, a little heavy on, on the guitar instrumental side. But, of course, there's been a lot of vocal tracks with vocal guests throughout the years and a couple of hits as well that way. But then, um, you know, I've always been a very rhythmic and a melodic player at the same time. So uh, I think the, my audience is attracted to the songs that I present on the records, the melodies. And... Uh, you know, it, it it definitely ranges from from jazz to to funky to uh, to a bit of fusion to uh, definitely some world music elements. I have a great connection with Brazil and Brazilian music, and I guess for the most part, my guitar style is recognizable, especially for the fans that uh, have been fans. They they know the sound. Do you listen to a lot of music? Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. My son also is 23 years old and uh, plays drums since he was five. So, and he's, excuse me, he's playing with my uh, band these days. And he is uh, like a lot of young people, especially young musicians. He's just music 24 seven. So what I'm not checking out, he makes sure I do. (laughs) What do you look for in a musical collaborator? Well, uh, that's a, that's a big question. Sometimes, somebody that it, it works both ways uh, somebody like dave grusen the great pianist composer who's been my musical partner for so many decades he and i think the same way about music his piano is a perfect blend with my guitar my guitar is a great blend with his piano stylings and so the two of us know each other like like brothers you know musically in every other way and so harmonically rhythmically space-wise, production-wise, the respect of, of a great sound, everything that you could think possibly think of, Dave and I are a match. That's, that's one kind of match. The other kind of match is when somebody brings something to the party that is completely opposite of what you do, and yet you find some common thread. So when I did the Six String Theory record and I had all those legendary guitar players on that record, for instance, working with Joe Bonamassa, the great blues guitar player, he he's quite a bit younger than me, and so he grew up checking me out, and so he was familiar with what I do, and I got to know his style quite well and, and tried to find a song for him to do on the record that, that he he and I ended up kind of jointly picking. Give me one reason. It was just fun working with somebody who is you know musically very strong in the blues, in the blues rock area, and then I brought you know, my elements to it. So... Those kind of collaborations. Same thing with Keb Moe, even B.B. King, um, even when I played with Slash or even Steve Lukather, my buddy. You know, there's there's some common ground, but sometimes the opposites attract. I wanted to talk about Dave Grusin for just a moment. Would you say that he is your best friend in music? Absolutely. I mean, he is my closest buddy. Has been, uh, you know, I've known him since I met him when I was 19 years old. I I met him. I was recording with uh, Sergio Mendes. Then I got lucky to hook up with Sergio Mendes when I was very young, and through my uh, great late Brazilian guitarist Oscar Castro Neves. And there was a party one day at Sergio's house, and Sergio's Brazilian band came there, and uh, Paulinho da Costa, the great world-renowned percussionist, was there, and and I s- sort of knew Paulinho already through Sergio and uh, Oscar. But then um, the great saxophonist Jerry Mulligan was there, Dave Grusin was there, and Antonio Carlos Chobin, the great legendary Brazilian 
composer was there. So it was quite a party for a 19-year-old. And I met Dave that day and had already seen him play and was very familiar with his work already. But And I was a fan. And and then we connected and uh, started. he started hiring me on his film scores. What is Dave Grusin like? First of all, he's from um, Colorado. And he is truly... a the rock he is he is just a mountain man he is uh, 82 years old now he walks faster than any of us in the airport he uh he just went on a 10 day 10 mile a day trek in chile recently he he climbed to the top of kilimanjaro when he was 75 years old he's he's just like he's going to last forever and uh, he does three crossword puzzles on a plane ride when the rest of us are trying to sleep and uh He's just so sharp, and then musically, he's just he's just the ultimate musician. You know, he just knows so much about music, and just uh, still, even today at 82, still just a great player. We're talking with Lee Rittenauer. You've contributed to over 3,000 sessions. What did those early recording sessions teach you? Well, that's a really good question. It taught me probably... Everything that has lasted for these kind of 50 years that I've been, you know, playing music and and doing it, you know, since I was a kid. But uh, even as a teenager, I started working. And um, once I kind of got with Dave Grusin and and then I I met Quincy Jones and met drummer Harvey Mason and all these people uh, and it started in and it was luckily it was a golden era of recording sessions so there was just fantastic musicians in LA and New York and Nashville so you know whether it was Steve Gadd or Harvey or David Foster or Richard T or Eric Gale or you know all the guys from Toto uh, Steve Lukather was a, a teenager at that point and but I was working with David Page and Jeff Beccaro and all these great producers you know uh, along with Dave Quincy later I got to work with Pink Floyd and so to answer the question, all this stuff taught me about amazing producers, production, putting a record together, arranging, orchestration, sounds. I was always a nut for guitar sounds in the studio, still am. And working with guys like Quincy and, and engineer Bruce Sweetie, and also working with all these great engineers, including my engineer Don Murray, that's been working with me since 1977 and has done all my records. But other engineers in L.A. that were the, the top ones, Tommy Vicari, Bill Cheney, Bruce Sweden, amongst uh, many others. So I, it was just like getting my Ph.D. in, 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 in putting records and music together. That uh, It's an education that's lasted a lifetime. It's probably pretty tough, but is there any of those early sessions where you played on someone's album that you're especially proud of? Well, <laughs> yeah, like you said, there's there's so many sessions. You know, some of them just stand out a little more than others. You know, I mean, once in a while there was a... I was be playing classical guitar on a big movie date with with Grusin or David Shire or, or John Williams. And so those were sometimes the most challenging kind of sessions. But then sessions with Quincy, for sure, were always outstanding I worked on a lot of George Benson's records. We were friends, and, I, and I'd and i always help George kind of with his sounds because I was the aficionado when it came to the sounds in the studio. And Quincy always said, let's, let's, come on, let's, let's hook George up with a, a cool sound for this song, and then I'd play rhythm guitar on it. So the Give Me the Night album was a blast because it was an entire album of just at a very high level of musicianship with, with Quincy and Benson and... Herbie Hancock and Lewis Johnson and Harvey and all sorts of great filling games, all sorts of great people. The Pink Floyd album, The Wall, that I played on was outstanding because that, that was a lesson in how a band like that could afford and had the craftsmanship to and the concentration to spend several years on one record. And, of course, then it sells, like I don't know, $25 million. <laughs> So uh, that was that was a unique experience. I didn't always get to work with Steely Dan because they always called me at the kind of at the last minute and I was usually busy, but, you know, I worked on Asia a little bit and uh, that was just amazing. The, the Barbara Streisand records, Barbara was just at the prime of her singing chops then, so she would 
sing live with the band in the studio and uh, and, and was just killing it all the time. So there was a, a, a lot of stuff. But at the same time, people, you know, don't know that, you know, being a studio musician at that time, that meant also, if you had the time, you'd t- accept a commercial and and maybe the, the the music for the commercial was kind of dumb. And so the sessions weren't always uh, Quincy and Pink Floyd. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to a musician named Jeff Pike, and I was asking him, who do you think the great guitarists are? And he said, for me, it's got to be Pat Metheny and Lee Rittenour. Uh, and, and I was telling him, I was saying, you know, one of the testaments to Lee Rittenour's ability is there's so many great guitarists that have him play on their albums. George Benson, Earl Clue, and you even played on the very first Earl Clue album. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And a lot of B.B. King records. Yeah, a lot of a lot of guys. Earl Clue was uh, always a, a favorite of ours. Uh, that's one of the earliest records that Dave Grusin and his uh, great late partner, Larry Rosen, produced that became GRP Records. That Earl's first and second record, I believe, were part of Dave's production. And um, Earl was just burning then, you know, and, and we were both just in our early 20s, you know, and... Uh, you know, he was just such a unique player back then that nobody had been, nobody was playing like them. He had his style from the very beginning. Are there certain circumstances or perhaps atmospheres that you feel are most conducive to creativity, to musical creativity? Well, um, it depends to what you're referring to. If you're referring to something specific like songwriting or being on stage, creating a, being in the zone with the band and the audience and having a, and a great show or coming up with the right part on a recording session. You know, there's all sorts of different kinds of creativity. Songwriting for me, I have over, uh, I don't know, 250 songs or something I've written through the course of all these albums. And um, that for me is, is sort of the ultimate creativity because it's a, uh, it is a, a, a long form of improvisation in a way. And how you get into that zone uh, for writing is, is something that's always incredibly challenging because you can sit and pick up the guitar and you can improvise something right off the bat, you know, a, a blues solo or a rock solo or a jazz solo. But and, and maybe if somebody asked me to write a tune in 10 minutes, I could write it, but it would never feel to me like it was spun out of out of pure magic. But what usually happens is that I write for a project, and I'll I'll, I'll specifically write for a project, and and sometimes that project has parameters that I'm looking for. It has certain musicians I'm writing for. It has a certain style I'm writing for. For me to just have a, a white open canvas and say do something, that's the hardest. You know, I like to have some kind of direction I'm going down. And then when I first write for the first couple of weeks, it's mostly garbage that comes out. It's 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 a repetition of something I've written before, or it's just not good, or it's like working a muscle. It's the same as a writer writing a, a book. You've just got to put in the time, and then eventually the good stuff comes starts to come. And once in a while, a song will appear just within a couple of minutes. You know, the, when you're finally in the zone and, and you've kind of given up all the pretension of, I should write this kind of thing or that kind of thing. And, and once in a while, a song will just appear and, and it'll literally, the whole thing will will come out in a matter of five or ten minutes and you kind of wonder, wow, where did that come from? And that that's the most magical time. There have been some artists that say that they don't like the label jazz. How do you feel about that, that title of, of genre? Well, you know, no musician likes to be completely pigeonholed because music is music and you know when you call somebody a certain kind of artist that almost in a way limits probably the way they look at themselves and and the and their abilities to maybe stretch what they do you know so i in general don't mind the category of jazz it's a very small world that we live in compared to the pop and rock and and R&B and hip hop world, uh, you know, it's a very small percentage of people that really listen to jazz and love jazz. But the interesting thing is, is that jazz is truly an American, um, you know, creation. 
and export around the world and and jazz is incredibly respected all around the world all sorts of places around the world you know from south america to asia to europe and and beyond it's a language that is also if it's instrumental is is easily digested around the world because you're not fighting lyrics that people don't understand and and jazz is i think more respected throughout the world than it is even in the states and it's something that also if you have fans like like i do fortunately they kind of last a lifetime so it's it's been nice and then jazz just the the word itself the the, the, the in the meaning of jazz you know is is improvisational and creative music that is constantly changing so fans of jazz have definitely more openness because the the mere definition of jazz is 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 spontaneous creation and and improvisation and so when i play one of my old songs i i i don't spin it this the way i recorded it 25 years ago it's it's got a, a fresh approach for that evening for that moment so that's why I love jazz. One of the things about a lot of the Lee Rittenauer albums is there's so many. They're just very distinct. What is the record that you want to make that you haven't made yet? <laughs> well, I'm actually kind of in the the middle of that record right now. I've with all the albums I've done, and like I mentioned earlier, um, they, they're they're plus forty, might be closer to forty five now. I've never done. A solo guitar album and so and and i have a, a lot of uh during my shows that uh, i have a couple of segments where it kind of breaks down and i improvise uh, a, a solo piece and that seems to be kind of a favorite for my fans sometimes and it's something that is always challenging for me because i've always been very comfortable with a rhythm section and a, and a group thing even though i had a extensive classical training and play the acoustic guitar extensively I've, I've never just said okay I'm going to do a, an, a solo project so now it's uh, it's coming out so it may not be out till next year but uh, it's uh, it's rising to the top <laughs> writing for that album has been fun I was down in Brazil over the, the Christmas holidays and, and uh, took an acoustic guitar with me and did a lot of writing and, and here in LA I've been doing the same and and just at a point where I'm, uh, when I have some breaks, I'll start to record some of these pieces. There's a song on your album, Portrait, G. Ritt. And I was listening to that, and then, of course, Kenny G. playing saxophone, and I saw that you actually wrote that song with him? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Kenny and I had met years ago, actually before he had his kind of breakthrough hit, and he was... He was originally part of uh, Jeff Lorber's band and, and out of, um, you know, the Seattle, Portland, that whole area up there. And and he came down kind of coming to into L.A. playing a lot of tenor sax in those days, inspired by Grover Washington. And that's kind of when I met Kenny and, and, and we uh, we connected and, and, and did that one tune on my record. It was very, very shortly after that that he had, you know, his first huge hit with Clive Davis and his career took off. Is there anything about your career that knowing what you now know, you would change? Well, you know, it, it's probably not, but it's interesting that I've had really two careers. You know, I even though I uh, got signed when I was very young to uh, Epic Records, I think I was 23, and which was a part of Columbia, which became Sony, and and there I did two albums, including Captain Fingers. And then after that, I moved to Electra Records for seven years. But during that, that period, the, the two career part was, of course, the first part was uh, being a studio musician. And uh, when I grew up, my dad and mom were very, very positive and incredibly, incredibly helpful of getting me all the best teachers. And I went to USC and studied with all the, the best people in L.A., including classical guitarist Christopher Park and, and a great teacher named Duke Miller that had really gave me my foundation. But I was also trained really to be a studio musician. I was around a lot of guys in L.A. who had nice careers as studio musicians and and studio work was a, an incredible living and, and also, you know, you were able to stay home. So 
but I had this desire to play live and I had this desire to make my own record. So I, I had this thing gnawing at me. So I first concentrated on being a studio player and fortunately hit that stride kind of the top of the, the ladder with a few other guitarists in LA, fairly young, very young actually. And then, then I started to make my records, but I wasn't as committed to uh, the albums because I was still busy as a studio player. Then at one point when I finally signed to Electra, I guess maybe I was around 27 or 28, I, I put the studio career away and said, I'm not going to do this anymore. And then had to change careers and concentrate on being an artist, which was a whole different challenge. And uh, so I don't regret that, that road, but you know, some others like John Schofield or Pat Metheny or uh, a few others, they, they pretty much pursued their music from a very young age and just concentrated on that going out on the road, even when they were, you know, 19, 20, 21, 22 and, and hitting the road hard, developing their uh, core audience. I, I did it a little differently and uh, I don't regret it because as we said, when we started this interview that, you know, studio work gave me really the foundation for my versatility and, and for the, the passion I have for all kinds of music and, and my, production quality that I do on my records and et cetera. So it's gone, it's gone, I guess, as planned. <laughs> hmm. Do you compete with anyone? Uh, you know, when I was very young, I was very competitive. You know, you had to be very competitive to, to get into the studio work because there was a bunch of other good guitar players still hoping to, to get to the top of the ladder. And, and then even as an artist, you know, when you're, you're young, you feel, Oh, that guy got to do this, or or I want to make sure I do that before that guy does it, or so I I had that that burning kind of quality in me to to get ahead, you know, and 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 make it, you know. But then as the years rolled on, that kind of smoothed out, and and it's you know the the competition thing is is really not there anymore. But you know, of course, I've been successful for a long time, so I don't feel that same kind of um, burning from the competitive point of view but even at this old age now and uh and doing it everything that i've done i i still feel like i'm trying to make it in a way you know that's that's the that's the positive point of of being a musician that's trying to always get better so i i still have a, a feeling like oh, i can do better or, or i want to try to do this or get together with this collaboration or you know, or make this kind of record or, you know, or I need a bigger budget to, to do this kind of record. So, you know, I feel like you can never, if you're sitting still in your career, that means you're probably not going forward. So you always have to, you always have to have a bit of a competitive spirit, at least with yourself. So you think it's important to be self-critical? Oh, very much so. Sure, of course. You know, it's it's a very important. You know, I mean, you can't. You have to also live life, so you you can't. You know, sometimes that makes people crazy. So, being a musician is finding the right balance for your life as well. I hope you don't think this is a silly question. How do you come up with the names of your songs? <laughs> well, that's especially when they're instrumental. That's not so easy sometimes. I try to fit the mood and. Once in a while, some phrase or title will come by that has nothing to do with a particular song I'm working on. It maybe I might even not be working on a song at that moment, but I kind of remember the title and I say, "Oh, that might be a good song title someday." And then when the the music matches the title, and I sometimes fit it that way. There have been so many artists that you've worked with, recorded, performed with. Is there anyone you'd like to work with that you haven't yet? Oh, wow. Yeah, there's just tons of artists, you know. Um, there's always guitar players that, you know, would be interesting to collaborate with and, and other. Is it Brad Meldow a pianist that I, I love that I haven't had a chance to work with? Kurt Rosenwinkel, a uh, jazz guitarist that I think is terrific. Uh, there's just all sorts of people, you know, some pop and R&B people and so Brazilian artists and world music artists and you know, every once in a while I just hear something that I say, oh, wow, it'd be cool to play with that person, you know. Well, my last question, I would just kind of give you the stage for our listening audience. What would you say to them? 
Well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for checking in on the radio show and, and uh, listening and uh, glad to hear that there's some fans and friends out there listening. And for the younger musicians that are out there, um, just keep going and, and music education in any way, whether it's lessons on the, the Internet or with a private teacher or at a school or university. The only insurance policy a musician has is education and and to learn as much as possible about your instrument and music in general to, uh, to keep ahead of the pack and, and keep going. Because, you know, a lot of musicians, they'll come up with something that they play really uniquely in on their instrument and, and maybe it lasts for a number of years, maybe five years or maybe even longer. But then if they don't really know anything else and they can't expand from that, then that that style or that those few licks become um, outdated later and, and they get they get left behind. So uh, music education provides the basis for uh, for you to understand how to keep growing and change your style, even though you want to still be you, you know, and it's very important for young musicians to create their own style. Songwriting is one way that helps sort of find your style because it's the purest form of uh, expression, I think. You know, nobody needs another uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan or Jimi Hendrix or George Benson. You know, that we, we, we have those people cemented in life, and so you have to try to be original. And sometimes borrowing a little bit from here and a little bit from there, it's like cooking in the kitchen. You put a bunch of spices together and uh, it ends up being an original dish. So that's what I always recommend for uh, young musicians. For more information, it's LeeRittenour.com. Mr. Rittenour, thank you so much for coming on the program. All right, Paul. Great. Great talking to you. And uh, <clears throat> we'll catch up again. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye.